Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to my video on anemia. We're going to go through the workup of anemia, how to determine what's the cause and how to treat it. Okay, so for our purposes, hemoglobin less than 12, we're going to start looking for causes of anemia. Now, it's different for men and women. You know, men it's 13.5, women it's 12. But let's take the lower cutoff because low hemoglobins are so common in the hospital and most people kind of ignore it but we're gonna take a little bit of a dive, to put some mental effort in to try to fix this number and uh, get our patients treated to optimize their hemoglobins. Okay, so before we start, if your hemoglobin is less than seven or less than eight in someone with cardiovascular risk factors, you transfuse, okay? That's just a quick reminder and a quick review. Make sure you have an active type and screen, make sure you've consented the person for blood so that they can receive it and uh, you can hopefully save their life. Next thing is, so we have a low hemoglobin, okay? Less than 12, what's the first number I'm looking at? It's the MCV. That's gonna classify our anemia into one of three categories, microcytic, normocytic, or macrocytic. Now, let's talk about microcytic first. So when I have a microcytic anemia, I'm looking at iron. Iron is your number one suspect. And if, in fact, it really is your only a suspect in this case. So we're going to do a ferritin and a TIBC. That's going to tell us 90% of the information getting us there. Okay. So both ferritin is your iron storage molecule and TIBC is your iron transporter. So you think, what does my body want to do? If my ferritin is high, that means my body wants to store iron. If my ferritin is low, that means my body is losing iron and the stores are running low. If uh, my TIBC is high, then my transferrin molecule is high and my body wants to capture iron. And if my TIBC is low, my body does not want to capture iron because of uh, a disease process going on. Okay. So in most of the cases, ferritin and transferrin will go in opposite directions. So a low ferritin means low iron stores and a high TIBC means uh, high transferrin molecules. And those both mean that you're an iron deficient. Your body wants to capture iron with the TIBC and your body does not have enough iron stores with the ferritin. Now let's go to cases where the ferritin is high or normal. Okay. So you have a microcytic anemia, you know, something's going up with iron. Iron's not being used properly. Uh, not enough of it's going around. It's not producing good hemoglobin. And your ferritin is high. So your iron is there. It's just in storage because something is going on that hemoglobin is not being produced properly or should not be produced in this case. Okay. So let's just skip over here. Okay. So ferritin, normal high. TIBC is not so crucial in this case what are we looking at here okay so if ferritin is high and actually if ferritin is high and TIBC is high then you could still have an iron deficiency but let's say ferritin is high and TIBC is low so our body does not want to transport iron uh, to our cells with the TIBC does not want to capture it and it doesn't it wants to store it because it's being used inappropriately so your body recognizes the iron's being used inappropriately you're in one of these cases down here, anemia of chronic disease, a thalassemia, or a sideroblastic case. Okay, so how do I differentiate these? What lab tests am I ordering? CRP ESR is great. Most cases are going to be something like an anemia of chronic disease, where you either have a chronic infection or chronic inflammation. Remember, iron is going to oxidize in the Fenton reaction and create reactive oxygen species. So you want to store it and not have it floating around in the blood. So I'm gonna increase my ferritin with my iron being stored and I wanna reduce my TIBC. I don't wanna bind more of it to capture it, okay? I don't want it to be uh, readily available in the body. So I reduce TIBC. And in those cases, you're gonna see an elevated CSR, CRP and ESR. These are in people with chronic infections, cancers, anemia of chronic disease. So that can be one suspect. A second suspect is thalassemias, HBH, HB-BART, beta thalassemia. Now, in these cases, you're going to want to do a uh, hemoglobin electrophoresis to diagnose the patient. And these are kind of a little bit more rare of a case to see in the hospital. And then the third one is if I do a smear and I see basophilic stippling, ring sideroblasts, what's going on there? Well, my hemoglobin is not being manufactured appropriately, or the hemoglobin manufacturing process has gone awry. That's what sideroblastic anemia is. It's when iron is not appropriately incorporated into hemoglobin 
and so it accumulates in mitochondria and then it forms these ring sideroblasts and that happens very commonly with lead poisoning so lead inhibits the incorporation of iron into hemoglobin and that's what causes sideroblastic anemias where you have these ring sideroblasts and your iron is going to be inappropriately used so it's going to be stored up because it can't be used to make hemoglobin and if your hemoglobin is low you have a microcytic anemia okay so i hope that made sense we went through the microcytic cases remember ferritin remember tibc those are going to be your two linchpins of this workup and then uh, if you don't diagnose iron deficiency you're really going to want to start looking for anemia of chronic disease first and then if it's that's not there i would look for uh, sideroblastic and i would look for uh, beta thalassemia okay those would be like my secondary workups all right so moving on to normocytic anemias when my MCV is 80 to 100. Now I'm looking for reticulocytes, okay? Reticulocytes are gonna tell me whether my body uh, is being induced to produce more red blood cells or it doesn't have enough stimulation to produce more red blood cells. And what is the key stimulator of reticulocyte production? Well, it's EPO, okay? So I have low reticulocytes it means my body does not want to produce more because it's not stimulated. In that case, I have low EPO levels produced by the kidney in people with chronic kidney disease. Normocytic anemia is very common in the hospital setting, especially with your end-stage renal disease patients. You have anemia of chronic disease, well, anemia of chronic kidney disease in this case, okay? Now let's say uh, you have a lot of EPO and you still produce, you have, you know, normocytic anemia. So your body wants to produce these reticulocytes, but it cannot. It's because you have a plastic anemia. Your bone marrow is malfunctioning, okay? So your tick count's low, but your EPO is okay. So now I'm looking at my bone for my main cause. My tick count's low and my EPO is low, I'm looking for the kidney. So the EPO is a source, uh, sourced from the kidney Right? The bone marrow doesn't uh, source EPO, so the kidney's okay, it's pushing things along, and then the bone is not working. All right, now let's say my retic count is high and I have a normocytic anemia. What's going on? That means I'm producing normal red blood cells, but they're also being broken down. So I'm looking for signs of hemolysis. And what's what are those going to be? Those are going to be haptoglobin. Haptoglobin binds hemoglobin in the blood, so it's going to be reduced. LDH, which is lactate, it's going to be high because your red blood cells are anaerobic uh, metabolizers, so they're going to release lactate into the blood when they lyse. And bilirubin, okay, because heme gets converted into bilirubin when it's in the blood uncontrollably it gets metabolized by the liver uh, eventually but until it reaches then it's going to be indirect bilirubin so those are your markers for hemolysis so i'm trying to produce blood with my high retic count but something is also lysing it all right if my hemolysis is uh, if my hemolysis panel is positive then you have hemolytic anemia if my hemolysis panel is negative then you're bleeding from somewhere colon cancer uh, where you have, probably have a combination of anemia of chronic disease with active blood loss, the patient's internally bleeding from somewhere if you don't see it. Here you want to check for a, a stool guaiac, you want to check for hematuria in the urine, you want to see where they're losing the blood, you want to do an endoscopy colonoscopy pronto for these blood loss patients. Okay, let's do a quick recap on normocytic anemia. What am I looking for? So with microcytic, I was looking for iron, I was looking for ferritin, for TIBC. With normocytic, I'm looking for reticulocytes. I'm looking for my body's producing normal red blood cells, but something is happening to them downstream, okay? Either they're not being produced in high enough quantities, downstream or upstream, I'm sorry. So either they're not producing high enough quantities with the retic count being low, or if they're not being produced in, uh, they're being produced in equal enough quantities with the retic count being high, but they're being destroyed somewhere downstream. So low retic, my production pathway is affected, my kidneys and my bone. High retic, my end pathway is being affected. Uh, my blood cells are getting hemolyzed or lost in bleeding processes somewhere. 
Okay, so I hope that made sense. Everything here is pretty logical when you work up anemia. Now, our next culprit is macrocytic anemia. My red blood cells are too large, microcytic too small, normocytic just right. Uh, sorry, microcytic, let's make them small, okay? So in macrocytic anemia, the first thing you want to look at is a smear. Now, the smear will tell you a lot of information. If you have megaloblasts, then you quickly go to vitamin deficiency. It's folate or it's B12. And how do you differentiate the two? It's a methyl malonic acid level. Okay, you also have different symptoms with folate and B12 deficiency. B12, you're going to have those balance disturbances. The spinal cord is going to be affected. But both of these, you'll usually want to replete in people like alcoholics. Okay, but methyl malonic acid is going to be normal in folic acid deficiency and high in and uh, high in B12 deficiency because you need B12 to process this acid so it doesn't form. Okay, now let's say my meg I don't have megaloblasts in the smear then I'm going to be looking for all these other causes of a megaloblastic anemia. And these are a little bit uh, tricky to look for. So let's say you have a myelodysplastic syndrome, uh, thyroid disease can do this, multiple myeloma. These are the very weird culprits. So refer to this table if you end up in this territory because uh, you're going to have to probably consult hematology to help with the workup. Okay. Remember, in multiple myeloma, you're going to see other things like calcium is going to be high. You're going to see bone breakdown. You're going to see an M spike on your protein electrophoresis. Um, plasma cells are going to be high in the bone marrow biopsy. Hypothyroidism, you want to look for a TSH. Okay. And myelodysplastic syndromes, I'll let you refer to hemoc for those. Okay. All right. So treatments. Let's run through some quick treatments. Uh, for microcytic, normocytic, and everything in between. So if you have iron deficiency in your microcytic anemia, which is very common, you want to go to MD Calc and look for the Scanzoni formula. It'll tell you how much iron to give that person. You want to go with PO or IV. PO, usually iron sucrose is the one most people use, and IV is ferrous sulfate. Now, usually you can give this, uh, once you've calculated how much iron you need to replete, you can start giving PO. Uh, remember that uh, iron is better absorbed with vitamin C, so I like to give these patients orange juice or a vitamin C supplement on top of this to help them absorb the iron. And IV iron usually is used for people with uh, gastric problems, IBD, uh, renal anemias, on EPO, Jehovah Witnesses. So in these cases, you want to replete iron faster. So for renal deficiency, I would definitely want to replete iron a little more aggressively. IBD, you can't give the PO iron because it's going to irritate the gut. And Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, you also want to replete their iron as fast as possible uh, because you cannot transfuse these people. Okay? Anemia of chronic disease, you want to treat the underlying condition. Duh, and you're going to start EPO on these people and most of the time. Okay, beta thal and thalassemia patients, you want to transfuse folate supplement, itation, and chelation therapy. Okay? That's very important chelation therapy because these people are going to have excess iron in their blood from all those uh, thallus, uh, weird hemoglobins. Their red blood cells are going to lyse and they're going to create extra iron that's uh, w weirdly formed. You need to take that out. Okay, so chelate the extra iron in their blood and transfuse those people as needed with normal RBCs. Sideroblastic anemia. So this, remember, is when our hemoglobin isn't formed properly. You want to look for lead. You want to supplement with B6. Remember, B6 is one of the essential vitamins in the early hemoglobin production pathway, which we can go over in another video. But remember B6 because it's very crucial. You want to stop them from having alcohol. You want to look for drugs like chloramphenicol, isoniazid, linazolid. These are all culprits for a sideroblastic anemia. So review medications, very important. Okay. So now we've reviewed kind of the microcytic causes. Um, now let's go through the normocytic causes, uh, which is kidney disease. You want to give EPO, okay? Definitely give EPO if hemoglobin is less than 10, and you want to target 10 to 12. You don't want to go crazy. You know, 12 is our kind of cutoff for anemia. So as long as you're close to 11, 12, you're okay, especially in CKD patients who tend to be kind of frail. Aplastic anemia. In these cases, your bone marrow is kind of 
screwed, so you want to transfuse. Transfuse red blood cells, transfuse platelets, transfuse whatever you need in order to replete these people. And in hemolytic anemia, you definitely have a lot more work to do. Because now if your hemolytic labs are positive, you're looking for a whole host of new differentials. TTP, HUS, HELP syndrome, DIC, G6PD. Uh, all these conditions come with their own tests. You know, hypersplenism, make sure you ultrasound the abdomen. See if the spleen is growing big. See if they're sequestering platelets. Um, <coughs> HBC disease, hemoglobin C disease is another culprit here. So hemolytic is its own video in general. Uh, but make sure you watch out for these conditions and that they're on your differential if you have a hemolytic anemia. See which one fits the picture of your patient. Multiple myeloma for our uh, megaloblastic you know, case. We have this uh, high calcium state. Remember you do the SPEP with the M spike and mm, uh, plasma cells are going to be high on the bone marrow biopsy. And now our vitamin deficiencies, B12 and folate. So B12, you're going to have uh, this high MCV. Remember, uh, methylmalonic acid is going to be your differentiator. Okay, homocysteine you can also test for. It's going to be high in both. But uh, methylmalonic acid will help you differentiate. And in B12, you want to look out for pernicious anemia antibodies. And that's why in these cases, it's better to supplement IM. Usually you'll start with 30 micrograms IM daily, and then you'll have maintenance doses monthly. So start with IM supplementation for B12 deficiency. Folate, you can do PO, because this is most of the time the patient has poor nutrition, and you're going to see the normal methylmalonic acid in these patients. Usually when you supplement B12, you're always going to supplement folate together. Some people don't even test, they just supplement both and uh, hope for the best. Okay, so that goes through treatments. So general review, what am I looking for first? MCV. Then I'll do a ferritin, a retic, or a smear, depending on if I'm microcytic, normocytic, or macrocytic, okay? Then after that, my third step is going to be looking at EPO, ESR, CRP, and hemolysis. If you do these... Uh, seven steps, you're going to be pretty well set for identifying most of the anemias. All right, so if you take away anything from this, remember these seven steps, and you'll have most of the anemias down. For the other ones, we discuss them in the slides. I hope this video was helpful, and I'll see you in the next one.